welcome to Crime in Court. My name is Heather, and this is episode number 50 of the Canton Cover-Up Commonwealth vs. Karen Reed. And the title of this episode is Jury Hangs, But We Ain't Got No Quit. As you might know if you've been following this case, that is something that attorney Alan Jackson has said multiple times regarding the defense of Karen. So, uh, you probably have already heard that the jury hung. So, in this case, apparently, there was at least one or some individuals that actually believed that the Commonwealth proved their case, which is not believable to me. The only thing that really makes sense to me, and I don't want to be, like, spreading conspiracies without having concrete evidence, but I fully believe that the McAlberts may have gotten to someone on the jury or have been intimidating them, paying them off. I don't know, but what was the hell, what, what, what the hell was the point of them coming to the, uh, closing arguments, obviously to stare them down. I mean, there was no other point because Alan Jackson just had, you know, uh, was able to describe in his closing arguments the individuals and the people behind him that were very much responsible for the um, the loss of John's life, but also the cover-up of his life being lost. So, obviously we're talking about Officer John O'Keefe. He was a Boston police officer. And we're going to get started. So I'm going to get us started off with um, a little bit of the interaction between the judge and the jury. And um, they read, she finally did read the um, Tui Rodriguez charge. So on uh, Friday, the jury had come back and said, well, we can't come to any kind of agreement. She sent them back to continue working. That was like around lunchtime. And then at the very end of the day, we were like hopeful that they might make some progress because they asked to stay until 4.30 or 4.15 instead of leaving at 3.30, like the judge gave them the option to do. So they actually stayed and felt like, okay, maybe they're making progress. But then Monday morning, they come back and um, after, I mean, they took a, a couple more hours, I think. And then they came in and announced that they still could not come to an agreement. Judge Canoni read the Tui Rodriguez charge, which I went over in episode 49 we talked about that um regarding it's a it's a kind of an extreme last minute this is your last chance to either come up with a verdict or not but we're kind of urging you to come up with a verdict and maybe you know change your mind and look at the different perspectives that was the whole um kind of sentiment of the speech so she gave that charge they came back, did, did lunch, and then came back from lunch, and shortly thereafter, they announced uh, for the third time that they could not come up with any kind of consensus. And it's a very well-written note by the juror, the foreman. Um, so let's listen in. Before we do, please hit the like button. It helps the algorithm. It helps push this out to other people and it helps YouTube know topics that you're interested in. So let's, um, let me shrink my fill. Oops, wrong one. Okay, here we go. So this is Paul O'Keefe and we talked about him in the last episode as well. If you didn't catch it, Go check that out because we talked about his OUI and how Karen supported him, helped him. She bailed him out of jail the next day or whatever day, the same day, next day. I don't know what it was, but she bailed him out. And then also she helped support him, pay for his lawyer type of thing and, you know, supported him through this trying time that he was responsible for. 
he injured another man. I don't know. Like, I've heard rumors that the man was paralyzed. I'm not sure if that's true. I do know he had some neck and um, potentially some spine injury. So it's possible that he might have been paralyzed in it. But I'm not sure. So I don't want to put that rumor out. But this um, accident actually happened in, I believe it was October 2020 when Paul, when this happened. And so it's um, interesting if you missed it, go check that out. Also, I went over an incident where he was at a VFW hall, a woman in pink, and you know pink is Karen's color, so how dare she? A woman in pink came into the VFW hall asking to use the bathroom. The police were called. Paul called, the, or somebody on his behalf, called the police to come to the VFW hall because Paul felt harassed because a woman in pink came to use the bathroom. Additionally, there might have been some other people in pink outside of the hall, which the police told this is a private event only. You can't be here. And they left. There was no incident. The report said so. And but but it just is very telling why their first reaction is to call the police. So but yet they didn't call the police when John got injured and hurt himself somewhere on 34 Fairview Road or was forced into a physical altercation and ended up unconscious and injured and somehow managed to either crawl himself to the side of the road, which I doubt because he would have been unconscious, or have someone carry him to the side of the road. That's my speculation. Anyways, that's Paul O'Keefe for you. Um, I'm not saying that he did that, but I'm saying that that's what the Alberts, Mick Alberts, may have done. And Paul O'Keefe associates with them. Just saying. All right, so here, we're going to watch the, um, basically the judge declare a mistrial. So the jury's entering back in. Despite our rigorous efforts, I am in receipt of your note. Judge Canoni, despite our rigorous efforts, we continue to find ourselves at an impasse. Our perspectives on the evidence are starkly divided. Some members of the jury firmly believe that the evidence surpasses the burden of proof, establishing the elements of the charges beyond a reasonable doubt. Conversely, Others find the evidence fails to meet this standard and does not sufficiently establish the necessary elements of the charges. The deep division is not due to a lack of effort or diligence, but rather a sincere adherence to our individual principles and moral convictions. To continue to deliberate would be futile and only serve to force us to compromise these deeply held beliefs. I'm going to rewind that. I mean, these are some really really strong words. So there was a holdout that was like, I ain't changing my mind from nothing, which makes me think that Al the McAlberts may have gotten to them. So anyways, here, let's listen to that again and kind of break it down piece by piece what she says. All right, Mr. Foreman, I am in receipt of your note. Judge Canoni, despite our rigorous efforts, we continue to find ourselves at an impasse. Rigorous efforts. So they admit we've been trying we have been trying very hard to get to some kind of consensus but we still cannot we're we've been working we've tried hard at it but now we just can't our perspectives on the evidence are starkly divided some members of the jury firmly believe that the evidence surpasses the burden of proof firmly believe that the evidence surpasses the burden of proof, establishing the elements of the charges beyond a reasonable doubt. Con who? Who believes that? Some of the individuals believe? And she says some, but I can see her saying, I can, I can see the note being worded as such that it's some individuals, even if it's just one, because they wouldn't want to just single or... Um, you know, point someone out individually. So they might they might have worded it like some individuals think that they did do it uh, beyond reasonable doubt, and some people didn't. An impasse. 
Our perspectives on the evidence are starkly divided. Some members of the jury firmly believe that the evidence surpasses the burden of proof, establishing the elements of the charges beyond a reasonable doubt. How? I just want to say how, but okay. Conversely, others find the evidence fails to meet this standard and does not sufficiently establish the necessary elements of the charges. The deep division is not due to a lack of effort or diligence, but rather a sincere adherence to our individual principles and moral convictions. What the hell does that mean? Moral convictions, they're individual. I wish I had captions, but there's no captions on this video. <laughs> the deep division is not due to a lack of effort or diligence, but rather a sincere adherence to our individual principles and moral sincere adherence to our principles or convictions more and to convictions con so somebody's like somebody has some kind of belief that is prejudicing them to think one way or another and i'm i'm not going to speculate or guess but i just um it's either a holdout that was um that one of the McAlberts got to, or somebody who doesn't look at logic and reason and science and stuff and physics and stuff. <laughs> Continue to deliberate would be futile and only serve to force us to compromise these deeply held beliefs. I'm not going to do that to you folks. Your service is complete. I'm declaring a mistrial in this case. I'll be in to see you privately in a few minutes. So thank you so much for your service. Okay. All rise to the court, please. How? How did they not come to a not guilty? I just, I, I mean, I feel like I'm in the twilight zone. I know it's been said on Melanie Little's channel all the time, like you're in the twilight zone. It feels like opposite day like everything that the commonwealth says or does is actually the opposite of reality and we're just in some kind of alternate universe or something i don't know but it's very bizarre to me all right okay so the jury is leaving all right, I'd like to pick a status date to find out what our next move is. So I'd like to come back sometime maybe the end of July. I understand people have vacation schedules. Must be this Can we come in the week of the 21st? That's fine. There's John's mom. I feel bad for her, but to an extent. I mean, I feel sympathy for them for the loss of not one but two of their children and notice john's dad isn't even there so where was mr o'keefe senior john o'keefe senior was not there I'm listening to the verdict i think he was disgusted by this trial if you want my opinion you might notice that he didn't often sit by peggy his wife also, Paul and Peggy, you don't see sitting together. And there was a reason for that, too. Um, I don't, well, I don't know how much of this is true. I know to an extent some of it is true. But I, I also heard that, so when John's sister passed away, he, and the brother-in-law, then he wanted to take, um, he wanted to adopt the kids or at least take guardianship of them. And at the same time, Peggy O'Keefe fought for guardianship. And I don't know if Paul O'Keefe did too, but something went down and Paul O'Keefe and Peggy O'Keefe aren't necessarily talking. From what I've heard, I don't know, this is a speculation rumor, nothing specifically verified, but that's what I've heard. And so it's just very sad. She doesn't talk to any of her kids, I guess. Unless there's more kids that I don't know about that didn't go to the trial, but I don't know. So it just, it seems sad. Um, she's, uh, it seemed like she was 
I don't know why she was fighting John so hard. The courts obviously sided with John. He was making more money. He had more um, more things available to him. I believe she's on fixed income. And so anyways, I don't know what I'm getting into, but it was something that I had read and I thought I'd share it with you. And by the way, today's just going to be kind of be like a mix of a bunch of things that I wanted to go over after the um, verdict or, or mistrial was announced. So, Judge Canoni asked, can we do a hearing the week of the 21st, which is the third week of July. David Giannetti comes back with, how about the 22nd? She says, that day is not good for me. Just listen to this. Like, she said that week. And then she says, oh, no, that's not good for me. Is there another day that week? Could you do the 25th or 26th? Okay, the 22nd and the 24th are not great dates, so. But she asked him for that week. What about the, uh, the, the 19th and 9th? Isn't that whole week? No, that week's not good at teaching that I cannot get out of. Can we do uh, August 7th, 9th, any of those days? No, we'll, we'll do the 22nd. We'll go back to the, we'll go back to the 22nd at 2. So, well, why is it doing the spinny wheel? Um, so tw the 22nd at 2 p.m., we are going to learn more about whether the Commonwealth is going to press charges again, which they have said that they want to, and they're going to. So do I have a link to that? I don't. Hold on one second. All right, so here is a story. That I found on Boston. What is this? CBS News, Boston. Massachusetts prosecutors plan to retry Karen Reed case after mistrial, which is so stupid on their part because they're going to have to bring back all of those horrible witnesses. But it is pretty typical that a pro that the prosecutor or the DA's office will come out with a statement after a mistrial or a hung jury and saying we do intend to charge again but whether they do is a different story because they're they have to look at all the problems that they had in this trial that they had overcome so i don't know if they really think that their case is that strong so we'll see but quote the commonwealth intends to retry the case according to norfolk county district attorney michael morrissey um, that's all I really needed to share with you on that story. So, all right, but it is official. They announced it in a statement. I tried to find the statement. You know what? Hold on again. Whoops. Sorry, I forgot my mic. All right, so, um, here's what I found. Dedham, Norfolk County District Attorney Michael Morrissey says his office plans to retry Karen Reed, a Mansfield woman accused of ending the life of her Boston police officer boyfriend, Braintree native John O'Keefe, after Judge Beverly Canoni declared a mistrial Monday. Quote, first, we thank the O'Keefe family for their commitment and dedication to this long process. They maintain sight of the true core of this case to find justice for John O'Keefe according to David Traub, a spokesperson for the district attorney. The Commonwealth intends to retry the case, which, like I said, they kind of have to say to save face because this is a total loss for them because they thought they had enough to convict. And if they're, you know, a mistrial is, in a sense, it's a win for Karen. It doesn't feel like a win, but it's a win. Because it's not a guilty. She's not walking into prison. You know, she walked out of there free. And, I mean, of course, the possibility of another trial is still on her shoulders. But at least 
she gets to walk free another day to fight another day. So technically it's a win for her and a big loss for the prosecution. Um, Kanoni declared a mistrial Monday after the jury of six men and six women came back for the third time telling the judge they were deadlocked. Quote, our perspectives on the evidence are starkly divided. The note to Kanoni read. We read that earlier. Um, conversely, others find the evidence fails to meet. Oh, some members of the jury firmly believe that the evidence surpasses the burden of proof establishing the elements of the charges beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't know how, but some members think that. Conversely, others find that the evidence fails to meet the standard and does not sufficiently establish the necessary elements of the charges. And that should have been answer number one. So to me, I was thinking about it. I'm like, why would a McAlbert want to hold out? And not let there be a not guilty. Because for them, it puts them back in the spotlight as potential suspects if she's cleared. So who benefits from having a holdout on the jury? It's the McAlberts. Because Karen would much rather have an acquittal. Obviously, the prosecution wants a guilty. The only people that really benefit from a mistrial or prolonging it to another trial, the only people that benefit are the McAlberts, in my opinion. And you got to think about who benefits from whatever the situation is. To me, that's the McAlberts. Anyways, all right. So, sorry, that was... (laughs) A bit of a um, interesting rant that I went on. Sorry, or maybe maybe it wasn't interesting. I want you guys to watch this. I'm just going to mute this because there's no mic anyways. I'm just going to let it roll. We're going to watch. Um, sorry. So they do... Um, eventually decide on a July 22nd hearing at two and that's to discuss where they are and if they're going to retry the case. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to slow this down like all the way down before it happens. All right. I'm going to go all the way down. Watch. You're going to watch Paul O'Keefe say something to Karen on his way out. Okay, so Karen's hugging her dad right here. And this individual, Nick Rocco, is the one who tweeted what Paul said. So Paul's going to say something, and it doesn't look like it was nice. When you see Karen's reaction to it, he talks to her. We can't hear it, obviously. His uh, his wife, Erin, is trying to say, stop it. And... um. Here it goes in slow mo. So, this is them leaving. Everybody's saying goodbye. I guess we don't need to see the whole slow mo of the um, hugging. I could have played it a little faster here. She's hugging her friends, thanking them for all the support. And then. She's in she's in a happy moment here with her family because she's free to fight another day. And now here comes Paul. And he says, I'm not done with you yet. You can see Aaron say stop it and look at Karen's face as she turns back around. She looks disgusted. She she may or may not have said something to him, but she just looks like that effing jerk. <laughs> That's how I would be feeling. So, you guys want to watch that again? Let's watch it again one more time in slow-mo. All right. Here comes Aaron. In the tan coat. Paul's coming. I'm not done with you yet. She, and Aaron says, stop it. 
or something along those lines and look at Karen's face turning back around. Like, ugh, him. <laughs> I would be disgusted with him too, especially with all the evil glares that he gave her and for the fact that they all just turned on him. Another thing to remember is that when, I believe it was Carrie Roberts who testified to this on the stand, when um, they were informing Ms. O'Keefe about what had happened, Mrs. O'Keefe, they had, you know, Karen was explaining like, yeah, and I dropped him off there and blah, blah, blah. And then uh, Peggy's response was, you just left him there? Like all mad at him, at her, like it's her fault because she left an, a grown man at a party where he wanted to go. So I think they blame her for his death no matter what. No matter what, they were going to blame her because ultimately she dropped him off there. And that's her fault because she couldn't control him and say, no, I'm taking you back home. <laughs> And she gave him what he wanted by letting him go to this party that he wanted. And she's getting punished for it. So, something to think about. All right. So, the next thing that I wanted to share with you was Alan Jackson and David Unetti share a couple words outside the courthouse right after this mistrial is announced. So, here we go. Whoa, that was loud in my ear. Uh, oh, that's why I have it on slow mo. <laughs> um, let's go 1.25 and turn it down slightly. Okay. Folks, this is what it looks like when you bring false charges All against right. an innocent person. The Commonwealth did their worst. They brought the weight of the state based on spurious charges, based on compromised investigation and investigators and compromised witnesses. This is what it looks like. And guess what? They failed. They failed miserably and they'll continue to fail. No matter how long it takes, no matter how long they keep trying, we will not stop fighting. We have no quit. Alan, you're going to stay on? Go ahead. I, I just have two things to say, folks. Number one. I am in awe of the strength and courage of this remarkable client that I've had the privilege of representing since day one. And number two, I want to send a message to all of her supporters out there. Your support was invaluable. We are touched and we ask for your continued support. I'm not from Texas, like my colleague here. Uh, I'm, I'm a Boston kid, but I'll repeat what he said, which is we ain't got no quit. There you were hearing from and that was a very brief but very nice press release that uh they had after after court got out on monday so next i want to show you um, um let's be over here next i want to show you uh the supporters so it was actually a rainy day the day that the mistrial was announced but she still had hundreds if not thousands of supporters out there waiting to hear if there was going to be a verdict so here is her family and friends and supporters reacting Isn't it amazing to see all this press and just supporters, people there that like just want to get in on being part of something historic? This is um LTL, Brian from LTL. This is on his channel. He so people are like, oh, we're fans of yours. <laughs> That's Rita. Yeah, baby. Oh, 
Kelly. She's not going to jail. That's right. Free Karen Reed. Yes. Isn't it amazing? All those people out there showing up to support Karen and her family. Oh, I think it's great that uh, all those, all these individuals care enough about another individual in this world to spare some time out of their day to try to help. And I think that's great. And this case has made me feel so patriotic. It really has. Watching the live streams, especially Tom CPU's live streams in the mornings when court would be starting or um, in pre-trial hearings, he'd be out there too. All right, so the next thing that I wanted to bring to you was the speedy trial. So we have a speedy trial. Um, whatchamacallit? The statute. The standards of a speedy trial. This is from the Massachusetts Rules of Criminal Procedure. And I'm going to scroll down to... There's retrial. Um, where'd it go? Dismissal, case status. The heck, there was a whole section about retrial, and now I'm not seeing it. You guys see it? All right, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. Hold on one second. Sorry, okay, I thought it had a heading and it didn't. All right, <laughs> I was looking for the heading. All right, so if a retrial of the defendant is ordered, the trial shall commence within one year after the date that the action occasioning the retrial becomes final as extended by subdivision B2 of this rule, whatever. Okay, so the order of an appellate court requiring a retrial is final upon the issuance of the appellate court. That's not the case in this. Um, in this, in the event that the clerk of the appellate court fails to issue the, res okay, but we're not, it's not a appellate issue. If the defendant is not brought to trial, so this might be important. If the defendant is not brought to trial within the time limits of this subdivision as extended by subdivision, he shall be entitled upon motion to a dismissal of the charges. So let's say on July 22nd, Adam Lally, if he still has a job, and he shows up there, says, I want to retry this. We have every intention. We, we're we looking for a trial in the next three months or whatever. And let's say that there's a continuance after that and then another continuance after that. And then finally you get to a year out if it hasn't been prosecuted at that time. It pro you know, if it hasn't been tried at that time, then they can try to get a dismissal. Whether they do or not, that's totally up to the judge but so there you have it they have a year from within it's decided so if they decide on july 22nd of this month that it's going to that they are going to retry and it's it's official um then and it's on the on the record on, or on the calendar then they would probably um I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> this is going swimmingly. Um, I 
retrial would commence. Okay, so if they didn't do it by July 22nd of 2024, then they could get a dismissal. That's all. I really think I was trying to say. I don't know. Anyways, so that's that. But there might be a, a standard length of time, so it might be like 30 days, 60 days, in order for Adam Lolly to file a motion to try to, because I think they have to press the charges again or indict her again. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but they have to go through it all over again in some manner to get it um, back on her record there. Anyways, so that is that. Let's move on to this next clip I have, which is. Uh, nope. Hold on. This wasn't it. All right, so the next clip I want to share with you is from the Young Jerks. Attorney Mark Bedero was a guest on the show shortly after the mistrial was announced. He was actually on Melanie, Attorney Melanie Little show at the time it was announced. And the Young Jerks is another, I think he's also local to Massachusetts anyways, and he has been um, covering this case extensively as well. So um, he's done a really good job on it. So, all right. So the, um, and he has been having like nightly recaps with Bettero, which has just been, they've been phenomenal recaps. So here is a recap kind of of what Bettero, Mark Bettero thinks about this mistrial and what's to come. So I just want to give you a little bit of his thoughts. Uh, any final thoughts that you want to bring up tonight, Mark, or today, this is today, or is it, it's almost tonight. It's 4 52. Um, look, I mean, 99% of the time, if a defendant in a murder trial walks out with a mistrial on all accounts, it's party time. Um, I mean, like that, that's a huge win. Uh, not as high in this case because, you know, they wanted an acquittal and probably shouldn't have had it. But the key part of that sentence is walked out, as in free, not jail. So that's important. The mm -hmm. big loser today is still the DA's office because they're going to have to make a decision that's going to be full of political pressure, personnel decisions with terrible witnesses, civilians who don't want to uh, talk or do anything. Um, a lot of potential FBI pressure and they're going to be retrying a case if they choose to do it where they're at their high watermark. It's not going to get any better. It's most likely only going to get worse where the defense is going to have the chance to really reevaluate the whole process. They're going to have 60 something transcripts of prosecution witnesses. They're going to be able to kind of fine tune their strategy. So I think if there is a retrial, it's a huge advantage for the defense. I mean, it, it, which usually is the case. It almost always favors the defense. Um, so you factor that in. I think that eventually it's coming, a full acquittal or a dismissal of the indictment, if that's the way it goes instead, is coming. But it, it apparently is going to take some time because I think the DA will milk this, even if they're not going to try the case for as long as they can. But ultimately, whether they try it or not, I, I just can't see how they're going to get 12 people based on the evidence that you know is before you. And as you're going to hear most of it again, um, mm -hmm. would lead to any kind of conviction for anything. Exactly. So fear not everyone who's worried that Karen's going to get found guilty at the next trial. We don't need to worry about that. There's no way 12 individuals on a jury are all going to convict her based on the evidence, based on that testimony, based on the awful uh, witnesses that the Commonwealth put forth. Um, we'll see in another video, they lay out like how many witnesses, I think it's 68 witnesses for the Commonwealth and six witnesses for the defense. Like that's ridiculous how many witnesses they brought on here when they could have easily brought like one firefighter one or two of the cops on scene and then you know all the other key players they could have absolutely lolly could have absolutely condensed things because it was a very long drawn out 
process to get to what they think happened. And even then, none of that made sense. So, <laughs> all right. So the next clip that I want to show you is titled Michael Proctor Relieved of His Duties. So here we go. Relieved of his duties after mistrial. So I don't want to start from the beginning. I'm going to start at 208. So here is the announcement about Proctor getting rehomed. A big breaking development tonight. Kirsten, you just got new information about this lead state police investigator relieved of his duties. Break it all down for us. Yeah, Trooper Michael Proctor was under an internal affairs investigation by his own department, and we now know he has been suspended. Uh, this comes after several jaw-dropping moments during this trial where he was asked to read aloud some of his vulgar and disturbing text messages about Karen Reed. Massachusetts State Police Trooper and lead investigator in the Karen Reed murder trial, Michael Proctor, relieved from his duty effective immediately. State Police confirming the action in a statement saying, quote, Upon learning today's result, the department took immediate action to relieve Trooper Michael Proctor of duty and formally transfer him out of the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office State Police Detectives Unit. But did that say anything about firing him? No. No, Proctor is not fired. Um, where'd it go? Here we go. All right, so here's the statement from MSP News after the trial was announced it was a mistrial. This was their statement on their website. Okay, so the MSP, Massachusetts State Police News blog, official news blog. Colonel Mon's statement following the mistrial in Commonwealth versus Karen Reed. Following the mistrial in Commonwealth versus Karen Reed, the Massachusetts State Police would like to offer our condolences again to the family of Boston Police Officer John O'Keefe. First of all, thank you, Massachusetts State Police, but where's Boston Police? Like, have they said or done anything in support of John? No. Like, they're either they're all scared of Brian and what Brian might say or do, or there's they really believe I don't know but then if they believe that Karen did it then why didn't why wouldn't they be outraged in a trial so I don't know where the Boston police have been but they have been pretty much MIA this whole time in my opinion I don't know I'm sure some of them went to the funeral and things like that but after that I don't know what all right so we cannot imagine the way in which this result has heightened the O'Keefe family's immeasurable grief, heartache, and sense of loss. John lived a life of honorable service both to the city of Boston and the children entrusted to his care after the unexpected loss of life of his sister and brother-in-law. We will remember him. Upon learning today's result, let me repeat that again. Upon learning today's result, the department took immediate action to relieve Trooper Michael Proctor of duty and formally transfer him out of the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office State Police Detectives Unit. So he's no longer a detective in the Massachusetts State Police. They didn't say that he fired him, and we're going to see he still remains an active employee anyways. So this follows our previous decision to open an internal affairs investigation after information about serious misconduct emerged in testimony at the trial. This investigation is ongoing. So this, they're, they're still not giving us any information about the investigation, but they're saying it's ongoing and the move, removing him from active duty is 
part of that investigation, I'm assuming, part of the punishment of that investigation, but I don't think anything ever is going to happen to him unless the public cries out and says, fire him. Our focus remains on delivering the highest level of police services with professionalism and integrity. Colonel Mon. The department has relieved Trooper Proctor of duty effective immediately. He will also be transferred from the detective unit assigned to the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office effective Sunday, July 7, 2024. So he hasn't been fired and he's only being transferred to another office. He's just not a detective anymore, apparently. The collective bargaining agreement requires a five-day notice for any change of assignment, shift, functional role, etc. For this reason, the effective date of Trooper Proctor's transfer from the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office is effective on the first possible day, which is Sunday, July 7th, unless otherwise agreed to by the parties in any state police discipline process the trooper is subject to a duty status hearing where they will be retained on full duty, placed on restricted duty, suspended with pay, or suspended without pay. So those are potentially their punishments? What about fired? How about fired? They didn't list fired. (laughs) So Trooper Proctor is going to have a status hearing where They'll either put him back on full duty, place him on restricted duty, suspend him with pay, or suspend him without pay. But there's no fire. There's no lose job completely in that sentence. That's the problem for me that I have. Anybody else have a problem with that? I do. All right, so the next clip that I want to show you is also of Michael Proctor. This is the real never cracker. <laughs> we have our team in place tonight at six, but let's begin with NBC 10 investigator Kathy Curran. Kathy, you just spoke exclusively with one of the central figures in this case, state police trooper Michael Proctor. We all know his name, and it sounds like he wasn't thrilled to see you. Well, Glenn, you know, there's a lot of pressure on the lead investigator, Trooper Michael Proctor. We heard the disturbing texts about Karen Reed that he sent to friends, family members and co-workers. There's an internal investigation by state police, and we know there's an ongoing federal investigation into how this case was handled. Proctor what at, was at his home in Canton this afternoon when the Karen Reed case ended in a mistrial. We caught up with him just a few moments ago to ask him his thoughts on the outcome of the case. Trooper Proctor, Kathy Curran from NBC10. We'd like to ask you some questions. Do you, do you think your actions impacted the outcome of the trial? Get off of our lawn. I'm not on your lawn. I'm on the street. Do you have anything you'd like to say? You support your husband? And you heard it there. His wife. All right. So let's watch that encounter again. So Michael Proctor says, get off my effing lawn. Courtney Proctor, no, Elizabeth Proctor, sorry, his wife, Elizabeth, Courtney's his sister. Elizabeth Proctor is saying the same thing, get off my lawn. And then she says she fully supports her husband and calls Karen Reed an M word. Proctor what at, was at his home in Canton this afternoon when the Karen Reed case ended in a mistrial. We caught up with him just a few moments ago to ask him his thoughts on the outcome of the case. Trooper Proctor, Kathy Curran from NBC10. We'd like to ask you some questions. Do you, do you think your actions impacted the outcome of the trial? I'm not on your lawn. I'm on the street. Do you have anything you'd like to say? You support your husband? And you heard it there. His wife fully supports him and called Karen Reed a murderer. Testimony in the case showed Proctor was familiar with witnesses in this case. We reached out to state police about Proctor's current status with the department. They told us he's still employed and had no further comment at this time. Kathy Carton. 
Isn't this wild? In what other country? Well, maybe not country, but what other... <laughs> I guess any system of government is corrupt. It's just, it could be anywhere. Any country, this could be happening where the the uh, militant policing officials, sometimes they are military, are around, you know, I mean, they, and they gain so much power over the people, like Proctor, who, you say something and everybody believes you because you're a cop and you can you have the power to plant evidence and break taillights and put pieces into evidence that you didn't actually find on the scene all right so what do i have next for you oh this is good hold on i don't have it up all right so this is uh, one of the news outlets was able to get a quick quote from Alan Jackson regarding the statement um, about Michael Proctor being relieved of his duties. So regarding Trooper Michael Proctor being relieved of duty, um, Alan Jackson says this, Conduct has consequences. D.A. Morrissey backed this misogynist corrupt cop. And two hours after he announced he will pursue a second trial against an innocent woman, Karen Reed, the MSP announced that Michael Proctor, the lead investigator for the Commonwealth, has been relieved of duty because of, quote, serious misconduct that emerged in testimony at the trial, end quote. We look forward to another opportunity to reveal the truth about this unjust prosecution. Good luck. So that was what Alan Jackson said regarding the whole Michael Proctor being relieved of duty. But I still think it's not over. Like Brian Tully needs to go. Sergeant Buchanan needs to go. All the others, uh, Lieutenant Fanning, who we talked about in the Sandra Birchmore case. He's also, he, he was on, I think it was the text messages with Higgins and inappropriate things that were being said and, and inappropriate things being said with Proctor. I think he was on one of those text message threads and yeah. Um, and he was overseeing all the cops that were involved in the Sandra Birchmore case. And he himself may have had relations with Sandra Birchmore, a minor that they groomed from adolescence. Um, and then took her life when she got pregnant with one of the cop's babies. All right, so that's in another episode. And if you missed that, I recommend going and watching that. I do a, um, a video on how Sandra Birchmore and the Karen Reed case are connected. All right, so Jackson's response. Finally, my, my last, the last thing that I wanted to bring to you today was click on it oh no I have two more things sorry I almost forgot one so this other video was the only juror video that I could find someone speaking out from the jury she's an alternate and you don't actually see her you only hear you know this is why I think alternate or why I think the jurors haven't come out yet is because I think they realize now how big of a story this was and they might be a little scared to say something but um they, they might see you know all the misconduct and everything that's going on they might um, be a little scared to come out with their actual identity so this individual she was an alternate and she did not want her identity to be revealed so here is the court or the reporter giving her a uh, summation of what the juror said. So here it is. Oh, at six, we are hearing from a juror in this case. WBZ's Louisa Moeller spoke to a woman who was actually one of the alternate jurors. 
I just spoke with a member of the jury in the Karen Reed trial. She would like to be referred to as juror number three. Obviously, these folks have been through nine weeks of hard work. She did not want to go on camera, but was willing to let me take some handwritten notes and I'll consult them for accuracy. So juror number three was an alternate in this trial. That means that she was present throughout the entire trial, could listen to evidence and testimony, but was not present during deliberations. First, I asked her, how do you feel at this moment? She told me, quote, exhausted and disappointed. She told me she was, quote, not in the room where it happens. That's the deliberation. She said, quote, it was a lot to sit quietly in a room for almost a week. There were, of course, five days of deliberations. I asked her what she thought about this case and Karen Reen's guilt or innocence. She said, quote, I approached this trial as if I was taking one of my graduate level classes. I would get an A plus in note taking. And then I'm paraphrasing here, she says, I believe the Commonwealth did not do their job to convince me beyond a reasonable doubt that Karen Reed was guilty. Paraphrasing again, no one saw exactly what happened. She told me that watching both families throughout this process was painful and tragic. And then I asked her about Trooper Michael Proctor's testimony and his explosive and inappropriate texts about Karen Reed. She said his testimony would not have, even if it were not included in this case, she still believes that there would not have been enough evidence to convict Reed. So even without Michael Proctor's testimony, is that what she said? Without Michael Proctor's testimony? This process was painful and tragic. And then I asked her about Trooper Michael Proctor's testimony and uh, his explosive and inappropriate texts about Karen Reed. She said his testimony would not have, even if it were not included in this case, she still believes that there would not have been enough evidence to convict Reed. As for I agree. I don't think there was any evidence to convict Reed. I think the fact that her tail light got cracked that morning was pure luck for the McAlberts to then say, oh, well, she must have hit him with her tail light and make it look like that happened. Make it fit that narrative instead of instead of the original narrative that they wanted, which was she hit him in the back of the head with the, with his glass. That's what they originally wanted us to believe and then it turned into the car accident because of the taillight for the trial and the jurors she says it was a lovely group of people we celebrated birthdays we even did puzzles together now you've heard from my colleague christina rex and from legal experts that a jury is supposed to be representative of the public. And of course, if you talk to any member of the public, there's lots of differing opinions about this case. So there will certainly be more information from jury members and everyone else. All right, so that's done. So as you can see, <laughs> people are split. I don't think it's as split as the media is making it necessarily seem because I think anyone with a real brain would look at this case and figure out the truth. So on that note, <clears throat> I'm going to leave you with this. I'm going to put this link in the notes below. This is somebody had um, <laughs> douche nuts is their name on Reddit in the Justice for Karen Reed. Um, my dog is being annoying. Um, in the Justice for Karen Reed Reddit thread or Reddit page, um, uh, somebody took the time to put together all of the state and gov um state and district, uh, which we call it state and local officials, as they're calling it, who hold sway in Massachusetts. Uh, feel free to reach out to any of these individuals. So I'm going to leave you the link to this Reddit thread. And you have Governor Maura Healy, who has already been on record and said that she found uh, Michael Proctor to be disgusting. You have a bunch of, well, not everyone we're going to know, but if you're local, you might know who these people are. There's Assistant District Attorney Adam Lolly, who I found, and there's Michael Morrissey if you want to email him. Lolly, unfortunately, doesn't have 
his web or his email listed, but I would bet it would be adam.lolly at state.ma.us if anybody wants to try that and see if that works. But um, I also saw that they took Adam Lolly off of the phone directory. When you call, at, you can no longer select him as an option. He's no longer there. So that is, this is Tuesday, July, uh, yeah, July 2nd. And we had a verdict on July 1st, July 2nd, Adam Lally's extension is no longer on the main directory for the phone line at the Norfolk County office, district attorney's office. But you still, you still can call Michael Morrissey and tell him what you think or email him. Um... Let's see, he's got a Facebook too and some other things because he's running for election or, well, I don't know if he's running for election, but he's got a VoteMorrissey.com website. I don't know if he'll run for election next time. I, I think he has two years left. I remember somebody saying that. And then, so here's the Canton Police Town Administrator, Charles Duty, who he actually had a daughter who was at the house that night hanging out with the youngins, the young kids that were all alcoholics. And the adult alcoholics came home and then the craziness really happened. So I, I'm going to leave you this link in the notes below or in the description below. So you can go write a letter, tell Morris, I've written to Michael Morris and I told him he should um, just resign he should recuse himself from this case and resign totally from office. Um, I didn't get a response back, but that's okay. I didn't expect one. Um, I recommend if you have feelings that you'd like to share with local officials, officials in Massachusetts, any officials, any public figure that you want to share your thoughts with, you as the public have every right to do so. So if you wanted to write, say, Governor Maura Healey, and ask her to dismiss the charges on Karen Reed and to press charges on, oh, let's say, Michael Proctor, Michael Morrissey, um, Brian Albert, Brian Higgins, Jen McCabe, you know, all, I could just keep going. Why don't we start pressing some charges on the real culprits here, dismiss the charges from Karen Reed, and, um, Let's all let her, you know, let's move on. Let's let her live her life without the constant burden of knowing that the entire state of Massachusetts is after you and stacking the cards against you with lies and BS and fake buffoonery. I mean, I don't even know what else to call it. Like that Sally Port video being reversed. That's just insane to me. And there were so many other like shady and just dishonest things that Lolly did in this case. And it, it just shows that they had no trial. I mean, they had no case, but yet here we are mistrial and probably going to head into another trial because I don't think that they're going to, I don't think the Commonwealth is going to drop it. They have been fiercely persecuting Karen and Turtle Boy for over two years now. So I don't think that they're going to stop. Honestly, I do think they should. Not just because they don't have a case, but it, because I think that it's a waste of time waste of taxpayers money go search try to investigate whose ford edge was there that lucky told you about instead of going after karen and turtle boy for reporting the dishonest corrupt behavior of the cops in this case and that's all i gotta say let's actually investigate the real people who are crooks and corrupt and um, need to go in office and civilians 
if there are any civilians involved in this case that need to go to prison. I highly am for it. I'm I'm for it. I want to see it happen. I think Karen Reed needs her life back and we need some accountability for the real individuals who left John out there and let him succumb to his injuries and never look back. I mean, to cover it up and to Google Kyle Slonk dying cold, you were expecting it. You wanted it to happen. You were waiting for him to pass. You were giving enough time so that he would pass because she, remember, she had a stall. Karen that morning, they had to go back to One Meadows and then Carrie had to meet him and then they drove around and finally they found John. I really think that was a stall tactic. But I don't know. I wasn't there. I have many things to speculate on regarding this case and we could be here all day speculating. So you guys let me know what you think happened in this case. Do you think Karen did it? Do you think Brian Albert did it? Do you think Higgins did it? Do you think it was Colin Albert? I mean, <laughs> it could be anybody. Obviously, Chloe had something to do with it. Um, but besides Chloe, who else? Who else was involved? Was it a combination of those individuals? Let me know in the comments below who you think was responsible for John O'Keefe's death. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate you. Please hit that like button on your way out and I will see you guys in the next one. Take care. Bye now. If you've been impacted by a true crime and would like your story told in your own words, or if you or someone you know has been wrongfully convicted or accused of a crime, please write to crimeincourtchannel at gmail.com and tell us your real true crime encounters. Thanks for watching.